Hey cats, Ed Bud here. Time for another instalment of delicious running related info. It's running news time, let's get to it. Thanks for tuning in people, it is always appreciated. Thank you for joining us in this running airport departures lounge before we fly off on our next race. Four stories for you today. I will be looking at the newly unveiled Vaporfly Next% 3. I got some soon to be released running shoes for you over the next few weeks. I got a quick dive into some brand new Nike offerings. They do seem quite a change from the previous iterations. And I'll be taking a comedy look at a recent CNN article advising about the best running shoes for each category. Hopefully I'll be able to make it through that without laughing. Let's get to it. Okay, so story one is about the Vaporfly Next% 3. It does appear to be dropping in March 2023. Looks like a prototype version of the highly anticipated Super Shoe will drop around about the 6th of March. It's going to be $250 or 225 Earth credits here in the UK. So it's about the same price as the current model. So that's good to see. Well done, Nike. I guess. You know, in a world where the local computer exchange is completely full of people selling DVDs and games and broken laptops and stuff, you you do wonder what it's all about, really. People are in a pretty bad way at the moment. So, yeah, £225 is serious dough. Like you've mentioned across their info blasts about the shoe, apparently it is slightly lighter than before, though they are listing the weight in a US size 10, which is a bit odd, really. I'm not sure why they're doing that, because they don't normally do that. And when Nike don't normally do something, that means there's a reason. Runners World have quoted that the shoe is about 8.2 ounces or 233 grams for US men's 12. So that is my size, so UK 11, US 12. 233 grams is pretty much what you'd expect really from this type of shoe. I think it's a few grams in it maybe, not a massive saving. So don't expect some drastically lighter offering it's not going to be like that in some of the pictures here it almost looks like the forefoot is higher than the heel do you see do you see do you see clearly more stack in the heel but the carved out sections make it look like the shoe's kind of leaning back you can't unsee it now can you nike suggests that this one has more energy return <coughs> i'll translate that for you uh less energy loss than before though maybe not five percent because otherwise they probably would have called it the five percent a thinner upper, as always on every shoe that there's ever been. I see this version of the Vaporfly Next% Percent pretty much as the new iPhone, really, and here's why. Back in June 27th, 2007, Steve Jobs launched that first iPhone model. He was a pretty good salesman, that guy. Kind of what he was, really. Amongst other things, of course. The black polar neck and the New Balance shoes. Since Nike launched the Vaporfly six years ago, there have been very, very small refinements, subtle changes to it over time. It's gone up and down in terms of the actual weight, but it's pretty much stayed the same, really. Puma, Saucony, New Balance, Adidas, Asics, amongst others, have all got their version of this shoe. Some have succeeded to replicate the feel of the Vaporfly and others not so much. They've gone their own way. But have you noticed something? They're now so refined, like all of the models, that... They're kind of the same thing, really. Where the smartphone has slowly evolved over the last 15 years, that's kind of happened, really, with the Super Shoe game. And they all pretty much do the same thing now. It's down to what make you want, what brand you want, preference about the upper. You know, you can go on talking about it forever, but they are the same thing. So here's the new iPhone for you. I mean, the Nike Zoom X Vaporfly Next% 3. Does all the same things by all accounts as it does before. It's a few grams lighter, maybe. A bit more foam on the side wall, perhaps. I mean, it looks very, very close to the original one, doesn't it? Of course, the V2 is now heavily discounted for everybody. Well before Nike removed it from their website. All those discounts seem to have mysteriously disappeared on the day that they unveiled this new one. And that happens with the iPhone, doesn't it? They discount the previous one because, you know, it's old hat now. Who's going to want that? Will this new version, though, be as durable in the heel with less rubber there? I kind of wanted more, really, so I could get some more value out of it. Of course it's not. Another one of those shoes just with very, very subtle changes to it. It's almost identical to the previous one. Now, some people say you haven't got it on foot. You don't know how different it's going to be, really. Story two. CNN recently released a bewildering list of the best shoes in category. I'm going to give you my reaction 
to some of their choices. So this is me looking at it straight away, telling you what I think. My initial instant sort of feelings towards some of these choices. Here we go. Okay, so they've got the Fresh Foam 880 V12 as the best for power. Power? Uh, apparently it's denser and firmer, so you get more propulsive energy. You know, that's really what we need, isn't it? Furthermore, it's improved by a vented and breathable upper. But power? I'm, I'm not sure the 880 really is famed for being the most powerful of running shoes, so no, wrong. Okay, next up, the Clifton 8 from Hoka is the best for support due to its firm insole. Is that what Hoka are famous for these days? Okay, I don't think this is the best one that you could get for support, perhaps. Yeah, the EVA and the midsole might be on a slightly tougher side, maybe. I'm not talking like tougher, you know, Joey Ramone with his knuckle dusters or anything. But I think there's more forgiving rides out there with a bit of sort of heel support, maybe some medial support, perhaps some stuff from Asics, way better than that. So yeah, wrong on that one. Okay, next up, the Nova Blast 2. Absolutely not the best for sprinting. I'm not entirely sure where they got that from. It's far too compressive for that. Maybe you want like the Adidas Adios 6 or 7. Uh, the Streak Fly, maybe. That could be quite good for sprints. A little bit lower to the ground. This isn't a shoe that I'd select for sprinting for anybody, really. And they've mistakenly used a picture of the Asics Nova Blast 3 here as well. So uh, not particularly well researched or checked there. Wrong on this one. Next up, you've got the Brooks Ghost 15, which is apparently best for comfort. Uh, it's got rubber, air, and less dense foam, apparently, which results in a softer ride. I thought it was an all right sort of daily shoe, sort of do-it-all sort of thing. I wouldn't say it was the best option on the market for comfort, though. I think I'd probably give that at the moment to the Nimbus 25 from A6. Certainly more comfortable than the Ghost 15, perhaps if you were going over some longer distance. So wrong on this one. Best for shock absorption is the Invincible 3. I've got to be honest, I'm wearing them right now. Did a really hard session this morning and we had to do some walking just now just to get out and get some fresh air. And I've got to be honest, they are superb for impact absorption. They really are working a treat, saving the legs a little bit. So I'll give you this one, Sienna. Best for long runs, they've got the On Cloud Monster. Uh, if you like running on a sort of like a plastic board with very little cushion, then I suppose yes, good for long runs. Uh, go for it. The shoe's got an awful upper rear. I didn't like that at all. I just couldn't advise anyone going for a long run in this. I really don't see the appeal of it at all. So, wrong. That's a really costly mistake. I need to sell that shoe, actually. There's no point in hanging on to it. The Mizuno Wave Rider 26 are the best neutral shoe. I mean, the Speed 3, the Pegasus 39, Adios 7, the list goes on. There's so many good neutral shoes. I'm uh, not entirely sure why they put this one in there. It's a 12 mil drop as well. I think that's not going to appeal to everybody, is it? Like a PBAX type plate thing in the heel. No idea why this qualifies as the best neutral shoe around at the moment. So wrong. The Ultra Boost 22 for beginners. Nah, it's just too much weight. I think it's just too dense there. I mean, there's a lot of cushion, but I think there's other more reasonably sized and stacked shoes that are just lighter and cheaper for beginners. I can't see why they've chosen that. Wrong. Okay, they got the Puma Deviate Nitro 2. Best for high energy runners. <laughs> Don't think I'm one of those anymore. Maybe a few years ago, but not now. I think I can probably live with this one. I mean, you've got the carbon plate there. I think it's like a composite type plate. You've got some more of that Elite foam as well, the Nitro Elite in parts of the shoe. Really propulsive, really durable shoe. I really do like that one. Is it the best for high energy runners? Well, okay, I'll, I'll give you this one, CNN, but there are other options though. I'm, not entirely sure it's the very, very best. You could use it for that, though. Okay, last one up is the Kinvara 13 for speed. I'm not entirely sure why. Maybe they've selected this one because it's got a slightly lower stack. Their main reasoning, though, here is the larger toe box will stop blisters. Because that's a common thing when you're running at high speed, you get blisters. Because you're going so fast, your foot just you know, capitulates. I don't see why they wouldn't select the Street Fly or the Adios 7 for that, so... Yeah, a final wrong. So that leaves CNN with a score of 2 out of 10 for me, <laughs> in terms of all those categories. The best in category, 
Yeah, words fail me on this one. Okay, story three is a quick release roundup for you. New Balance have finally dropped some of their new models uh, a bit later, I suppose, a bit late to the table here. The Rebel 3 is out in a couple of new colorways, including this eye-melting pineapple thing that will undoubtedly take one run for me to completely sully. They've also dropped the predominantly white version of the Fuel Cell SC Elite 3. That's 219. Seems a weird option to me. There's less stack than the SC Trainer, but it seems to use the same plate. I don't quite understand how it works with New Balance right now. They're confusing me. It's a thinner upper. I just don't quite get it. The SC Elite 3 just seems like a bit of an odd one. I haven't really heard all that much about it. I haven't heard many people picking it up and using it that much. Seems to have drifted to the sideline a little bit. But it is out. I'm not sure I'm going to be spending much from the Edbud Earth Credit coffers to test this one out. It's just too rich for my liking. It does look like we're in for an update very soon to the viewers' favourite Reebok Float Ride Energy series. The Energy 5 set to drop in March by all accounts. A full update here, a reworked upper design, retooled midsole and outsole too. A full refresh for the model, which has seen the same midsole design for a couple of versions now. I think it's still going to come in under £100 and you'll always get discounts on these as well pretty soon after it's come out. It's no doubt a model that people will be keen to check out. I will try and grab one when it does release in March. Last up today, I've got a volley of new Nike releases for you, some better images and we can fully see some of the changes that the swoosh have put in. I'm talking about the Vomero 17, the new version of the Mylar as well, and the Structure 25. It looks like ZoomX updates to some degree for the Vomero and Mylar here in the early images. We can see quite a considerable upper and midsole redesign, which I think a lot of people will be very keen, happy to see a lug-filled outsole on the Vomero 17. The 16 was absolutely fantastic from that aspect, a really good all-round cruiser. Really happy to see that we've got ZoomX here and also that they're going to kind of combo it with another type of foam. Maybe it's the SRO2 stuff again, or maybe React. Either way, I think the Vomero could be a great shoe. The Myler is one shoe I haven't tried out and I haven't really been excited to try out either. Another React shoe isn't something that I needed in the lineup, but again here we can see some added Zoom X to spruce things up. Something that Nike badly needed to do with that model. I think Nike rests on their laurels a little bit, certainly over the pandemic really with some of their daily shoes. Just like outdated designs and poor utilization of some of the other foams they had available. All of the other brands just caught them up a little. Perhaps they didn't engage in that sort of remote working period as well as some of the other companies. Other brands just doing a little better since that time. Where well, we've got a larger amount of Zoom X in the top section of the Vomero 17, I think we've got a smaller amount here in the Myler, perhaps relying on that other foam a little more. Perhaps adjusting the stability of that so the Vomero sits somewhere in between the Pegasus and the Myler. Could be a perfect blend by all accounts there, maybe making it a better long run shoe. The Structure is another model that I haven't really messed with that much. Mrs. Edbud had a pair of really messed up her knees though. It's quite a tough shoe that one. It looks like Nike is sticking with Cushlon foam here though in the Structure this time round with a more considerable heel counter section around the back of the foot. Perhaps relying on a bit more structure away from the runner's foot so you're relying on the padding to sort of lock the foot in there at the back. Either way some really big updates to Nike's daily shoe lineup. Long overdue as well if you ask me. I mean, Saucony started utilising PBAX material and stuff other than race shoes back in 2020. A long time coming, Nike. That's all the stories in today's episode. Hope you enjoyed the show. Musical interlude time. I'm really keen on 60s surf music. There's nothing quite like a Fender reverb tank being pushed to the limits, perhaps through some sort of Fender bandmaster or showman. Dick Dale is the master though of that tone. He is the king of the surf guitar. He told us that himself. Misa Lu is one of the best tracks. You really can't beat that one. It is the ultimate surf tune. The noise that he manages to get out of that strat that he was playing is just like something from another world. It feels like the actual waves and the water crashing around you. But to play like that, you know, some people can try and imitate it, but only he could really do it. It's almost like a sort of rhythm to the actual strumming, tremolo picking that he does. It's not quite just doing it over and over. He's got like a rhythm, almost like it's a, a drum. If you listen very carefully, you can hear it. Some of the initial sort of strokes are that little bit sort of harder and tougher. 
and he's a little bit lighter with the pick after a little while really is something very difficult if you're a guitar player try and do it but the best version is one that was done on Jules Holland I believe he's got a bass player and a drummer and he's kind of brought the song into the mid 90s I suppose at that time it's wild lots of energy it sounds almost like a heavy metal track at one point Miseloo by Dick Dale thanks for tuning in people hope you enjoyed the running news today Please help the channel out by hitting that subscribe button and clicking the bell below for notifications. Also give this video a thumbs up, like, and share it with your running buddies. My name's Ed Bud, and I'll be seeing you.